Hi, have you heard about Bitcoin? Not Bitcoin, but Bipcoin. Bravo, India, Papa, coin. Bipcoin is a new cryptocurrency that you can start mining today for free on ordinary computers. Unlike most altcoins, Bipcoin is not a clone of Bitcoin. Bipcoin is based on entirely new, more recent, and better code called CryptoNote. So unlike Bitcoin, Bipcoin has truly untraceable transactions, does not require specialized mining rigs, and has adaptive limits. Plus, Bipcoin is the only cryptocurrency covered by the Bipcot no government license. This allows use and reuse by anyone except governments and government agents. If you're still kicking yourself in the head for not getting in on the ground floor of Bitcoin, start mining, using, and trading Bipcoin today. Not a guarantee. Mining Bipcoin costs you nothing but the electricity to run your computer. And we already take Bipcoin for stickers and buttons. Go to Bipcoin.org. That's Bipcoin.org. Once again, that's Bravo India Papa Coin.org. So it's always been a problem. And, you know, I look at books that are published by the industry and they suck. And the writing is terrible. The books are terrible. <laughs> the covers are terrible. And I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't care what the publishing industry thinks about what I'm doing. I'm going to do it my way. That's the way I've always done everything. And that's why I'm a poor, you know, starving artist and poor libertarian. But anyway. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 97th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. Find out more about this at BIPCOT.org. So we are back. I am Jeremy. I am joined, as always, by Dave. And what up, what up, what up? We have Andre here again with us this week. Hey, Andre. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's always a pleasure to be on. Yep. And this week, we have a guest, a returning guest, actually. Uh, it's been a while since we talked to him, but our author, Rand Eastwood, is back. Rand, how are you, my friend? It's good to talk to you. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on the show. It's my pleasure to be here. God, what yeah. episode was that? Yeah, I'm gonna, I, I meant to look that up before the show. I know it was way back in the... It's, it's been like a couple of years. 35, 30, 34? 30s, yeah, yeah it's, somewhere it's in the It's been 30s. a while. Somewhere it's in the been 30s. A while. I remember it was, it, was a good sh it was a good show. Yeah, but we had actually, I had talked to, I had actually talked to Rand and Andre a month or two ago about trying to get the two of them on the show together, and unfortunately, uh, Rand is one of the beautiful people who uses Macs, so he doesn't have, so he, <laughs> so Fiend phone is an issue for him, but since we ended up having to test out Discord, oh, that is actually, yeah, again, this week we are brought to you by Discord, because uh, we had to test that out when we had Mark Taylor on a few weeks ago, we realized that this works too, so I said, hey, we have a solution now, so figured we, now that we could get you back on the show, it made sense to do so, and we, uh, since since we last talked to you, you've been uh, kind of busy. You, you wrote a book and stuff, and published it, and uh, wrote a book and stuff like he did it in his free time. Yeah, you know, just while you know, just while you were doing nothing else, yeah. I was like, hey, I'm just going to write a book, you know. So, yeah, just throw a book out there. What the heck? Yeah. So sometimes that uh, that writer's block just disappears, and 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 you know, vast horizons of writers, the opposite of writer's block happens. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Like, like What's writer's the opposite of block? <laughs> like like diarrhea of the keyboard. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, I have those days. Trust me. <laughs> no, not you, Dave. Uh, well, this yeah, this by no means happened in a hurry. Believe me. So, I was no. gonna say that it's been it's there was a compilation of what over a decade of work. Sixteen years. Yeah, almost two decades of work. Wow, that's, that's getting it right there. Yeah, 16 years, you know, culmination of, of 16 years of, of my best stories. And then when I when I finally did decide to, I could do the book, it took me a year of putting the file together. And then when I designed the book and got it ready for publishing and edited it and tied all the stories together, uh, I was laid off at the time. And it, it so I worked full time, seven days a week, uh, eight to 12 hours a day for almost four months. Uh, and got it, got it done, and got it published. And uh, I don't think that I could be any happier with how it how it turned out. I'm I'm really happy with it. So, 
as as a I mean, perfectionist, that means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you know? exactly. And it's been a pleasure to read. Uh, I've had the chance to read it, and I mean, I I've gone on and on about how awesome this you know this compilation of stories is, and how much I love the stories in the book. But mm. it's you really did a fantastic job. Like it's it's what inspired me to start writing my own book. Which I don't think we've I said promise the title you, of the book. Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say before we bury the lead any further. Like, <laughs> I, I forgot to <laughs> that's mention right, it, that's right. That's right. Why don't, why don't you tell us? Why don't you tell us this, the, the title of the book, Rand? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the title is "Rolling the Bones," and the subtitle "Twelve Tales of Life, Death, Loss, and Redemption," because it, it's not a single genre book. It's a, it's a collection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's nine short stories and three novellas that over the years ended up spanning multiple genres. Mm -hmm. So I ended up having to change the name of the book uh, to try <laughs> come up with something that was that w that would really uh, kind of umbrella uh, all the different mm -hmm. subject matter that I wrote about, uh, you know. And and it's 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 basically normal everyday people that are in these extraordinary situations. So uh, rolling the bones, especially living in Vegas, rolling the bones still kind of carries the. Uh, little bit of a horror side to it with the bones the dark fic the dark fiction side with the bones part but also with the subtitle on the back is is sometimes we win sometimes we lose but every day we roll the bones so it just has oh. to do with hmm. with nice. with you know taking chances and and facing life every day and sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't and that's how the stories turned out that some of them have happy endings and <laughs> unfortunately some of them don't so it it kind of right. it kind of fit pretty well and and of course living in Vegas I kind of had to run with it so you know yeah. it's got a picture on the front of those black dice with uh, with that skull and crossbones on <laughs> one of them all you got to do I, is gamble for a little while and you'll really learn real quick that life ain't fair <laughs> yeah well I mean I I absolutely love the cover artwork I think you did an, a phenomenal job with it it looks polished oh. it looks it looks great Thank I mean, you. it really does Thank you. I mean that's that was one of my favorite parts about the book aside from the stories yeah, I did. Uh, I did the photography myself, and I did. Of course, I'm going on 25 years of graphic design experience, so I did uh, all the the actual artwork myself as well. Plus, wrote the book. So it's kind of one of the reasons I'm really proud of the product. Is you know, I did the interior design, I did the cover design, <laughs> I did the photography, I wrote the book. You know, it's it's all. You poured the concrete. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much, and so I really appreciate it whenever anybody. You know, mentions that they like the cover like you just did. I thank you very much. I I appreciate remarks like that just as much as saying that you liked reading the book. So, well, that kind of I mean, I hate to sound fanboyish, but it really well, is. Andre's just <laughs> just suck, <laughs> he's just sucking book, up. So, <laughs> you well, hate I mean, to sound, you know, it's it, well, he's going to be my publisher, so I have to make him, <laughs> you know, I have to play him up and make him sound good, right? Yeah. Promotion, cross promotion. Don't, don't want to insult no. the guy yeah. who's going to be helping. Andre's out, told right? me multiple times he's a big fan of you. Uh, he was like, "We got to get him on the show. We got to get him on the show." So we we were like, "All right, well, we've had him on. And we'll ask him again." So well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you came on to talk about rolling the bones and. Yeah, hi. I mean, I was really surprised. This being a liberty oriented show, I I didn't really think that talking about my book would really fit in with your program, but. You guys were receptive to it. I really appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, like, so, I, well, I was just gonna say, like, I mean, I, I, like you and I talked previously about this that, you know, we try to, yeah, we're we're liberty liberty orientated, I guess, but I, I I never wanted to be one of those shows that just only just keeps rehashing the same old thing, the same old thing, and you know, we've had other, uh, you know, entrepreneurs like a Pat's call in show. <laughs> yeah, we've had like other entrepreneurs and stuff come on that were like just because they were they called themselves you know anarchists or libertarians, it didn't matter. You know, it was like okay, well now we get to see what you're doing with you know <laughs> and 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 different it aspects. Lets and especially because of the not just you know writing the book but like you were talking about doing all the steps yourself uh i mean that makes sense from the that's, the perfectionist point of view i under, i understand that as somebody who has has who has battled ocd most of his life and it drives me nuts <laughs> and i usually just throw everybody out of the way and insist on doing everything myself you know uh, right so i get that <laughs> right i i was just going to bring that up because um i i always wanted to do it myself and it isn't until recently that the technology was there to really do it mm -hmm. myself. 
So, you know, and, and how, does, how does it's it not just Amazon these days. Do you, can you just like get a book deal with them? Cause I, I know they print all their books basically on site unless it's like a super rare book or something. Uh, it is print on demand. It's through, uh, they own, uh, create space. Okay. Uh, create space is what you do. If you're going to publish a, a hard, you know, a hard copy, I, I have mine out in trade paperback. It's, like 500 pages trade paperback book. So I set that up and published it through their division of create space. And then, you know, depending on your distribution channels and things, then it goes, goes on to Amazon automatically part of your distribution. Uh, then if you do Kindle, which I eventually did do, uh, the Kindle version, I do that through the Kindle module of Amazon. Mm -hmm. So it's two, it's actually two different, ways you go through it and then also you know barnes and noble has picked it up and and they carry it on their website and i just found out that walmart is carrying it on their website now too oh. wow uh, all right so, so yeah i have and, and i've and i've seen it on some other it's on ebay somebody's selling one on ebay in australia and uh <laughs> it's it's and and there's some other there's some other book related like like independent websites, book related websites that I have. I wonder it if for rolling sale. the bones means something completely different in Australia. It probably uh, does. They're know. weirdos over it, there. It yeah, it might it might be. You know the <laughs> it, it, that comes from the dice were originally made from ivory, so that right. You know, yeah. and yeah. that was from a long time ago. I would imagine it's the same, but who knows? It, you know, it might be offending somebody somewhere. It, it I mean, yeah, something. but who cares? Everybody's offended by something these days. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. getting back to the we have to the we have trigger the, warnings uh, implied on this show already, Rand. Yeah, I gave one at <laughs> oh, the beginning okay. of the year. I do it every year. I start right. the year off with a blanket trigger warning for everything we do. <laughs> so you're covered right. automatically. Like, well, it's like well, the Liberty Pope. He just says that he says the prayer, the triggered prayer <laughs> for the year. <laughs> yeah. So you know, to get back to the anarchy, the anarchist in myself side of things is. I've always been a self thinker and it only made sense that I would eventually end up in the libertarian and anarchist movement because it, it just never occurred to me to get permission to do things from un, unrelated parties. And so I was always <laughs> in trouble as a kid because I get an idea in my head. I just start doing it. And all of a sudden I'm in all this trouble and like, what, what, you know, isn't it cool? They, they don't care what I'm doing. It's just the fact I didn't have permission or I wasn't doing it the way they told me to do it, whatever. So it's always been a problem. And, you know, I look at books that are published by the industry and they suck. And the writing is terrible. The books are terrible. <laughs> the covers are terrible. And I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't care what the publishing industry thinks about what I'm doing. I'm going to do it my way. That's the way I've always done everything. And that's why I'm a poor, you know, starving artist and poor libertarian. But anyway, <laughs> so that all, that all does play into it. The fact that if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it my way. And the only way I could do that was for technology to catch up to the place where I could actually do it myself and do all of it myself. I mean, when I was younger, you could self publish, but you still went through a publisher and you paid thousands and thousands of dollars yeah, you know, for, or, to, to, yeah. for them to, you know, and you get like one case of books for all that money and have to try to sell them yourself. And there wasn't the internet and, and you couldn't do everything automatically the way you can now. So, you know, it, 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 right about the time I was where I thought I could do a book with the material I had over the last 16 years, the technology was there. I said, Hey, I'll just do it myself. So I spent a year doing it and it was blood, sweat and tears, but I'm glad I did it. So. Yeah. Well, not, not only that, but now that you've done that and that's, uh, I'm actually glad you, uh, we went down this tack right from the bat. Cause I want to mention this going, going back to, you know, voluntary interactions and, and not, not engaging people that are not party to things. I mm -hmm. am now in talks with you to publish my book, the one that I'm still editing and proofing, which I promise it'll be done by the end of this week. I swear <laughs> <It's> All right, <clears throat> it'll be done by the end of this week. I swear. But uh, no, and your experience and everything you've done with this book, and that's part of the reason why I, I absolutely love this book is because you did it yourself. You did right. this from the ground up. You wrote everything, you produced it all, and you published it yourself. And I am going to be relying on that expertise to help me through the process. 
So well, exa I, exactly. Um, the way you know, it, it's. I'm glad we both came together this way because after I did it, and really struggled, uh, it, it is a lot of it is automated, but there there aren't really instructions. There's not detailed instructions. You have to work with support people if you have any questions through the process. And I had no clue, you know. So, but the support people were great. They always got back to me within a day with the answers I needed. It's just it's not readily available right there on the site. And they do have it, a lot of it automated where you can get a cover template and you can get a book template and you can just upload a text file and automate the whole thing, but you're going to have a real crappy looking book, you know. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. So once I struggled through, and I went through four actual physical proofs before I had it, just like I just like I wanted. I was really struggling with the uh, with the the uh, binding of the book. They they weren't staying within their own spec on the binding, and we were having all kinds of problems get this getting the spine to line up right. Again, I'm a perfectionist, and if it's hmm. off a sixteenth of an inch, I'm going what the hell. But anyway, so finally, I figured out that they weren't going to be able to stay within their own spec. So I adjusted my artwork to, you know, to make it wrong so it would come out right. When it, you know, once they folded it and binded it, then the spine was in the right position. So I struggled through all that. And that's when I came up with, you know, and I have my, my Woodlands Press publisher's imprint. Um, when I thought, you know, well, if somebody else is trying to do this now I know how to do it and plus I can do the artwork and and I've been in I've worked in publishing before I was a publications manager for a manufacturing firm in Indiana many years ago and I worked with an in-house print shop and and I wrote and published something like 40 parts and user manuals for our equipment uh, both here and in the UK uh, so I was familiar with the book design process the book layout and the, and the printing side of things uh, printing and binding so I thought, well, you know, I can put all this together and maybe somebody else could use this service. I could do a book for somebody else. And right about the time that I put the Woodlands Press Facebook page out as a book design and publishing service, well, Andre and I hooked up and I read some of his short stories. I think that was over on Steam It. Is that where you were yes. publishing? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I was impressed. Um, I read... I read, like I said, professionally published stuff by authors that I think sucks a lot of times. And, uh, I, you know, I cringe my way through it. Uh, it it's, it's twofold. It's, it's either the book is produced terribly, it's, you know, it's not an aesthetically pleasing text, you know, and, and the editing isn't very good, it's clunky sentences, or just the writing. You know, I, I can't even read Stephen King anymore. It's just, it's like young adult fiction, and, and it's just... Yeah, yeah. I just don't think it's very well written. <laughs> but when when I was reading, so I read a lot of crap. I think, man, how did this even get published? But when I was reading Andre's stories, I didn't get that. I mean, yeah, there's some sentences that probably could be cleaned up a little bit, but it wasn't bad at all. It was actually pretty good. And you know, he's young and just starting out on, with his writing. And so here, you know, it was a perfect match. So here's a guy that's got really good potential as as a as an author i think some talent and, a little bit a little bit and uh yeah, I mean, you're not bad you know, so and then and then <laughs> i've got i've got the ability to help him with the uh with the publishing side of things and then you know however however much he he he's comfortable with me helping him with any kind of editing that might be done but that's going to be up to him to you know to try to get the make the book as good as it can be so it was it was a perfect match i think and uh, it'll, I'm, I'm just as excited as he is to see how the process, how well we handle the process of working together as author and publisher now and, and put out a really good product for him. And this was all done through the magic of the market. And that's one of the <laughs> things I absolutely love about this is uh, like, I want, I want the service that he's offering. And I'm assuming, Rand, you would like the profit that comes from the business that you're providing me. <laughs> yeah. No, actually what happened, the truth is Andre put a gun in my head <laughs> and said, 
said, you're going to help me with this because otherwise wow. you're just, you know. Well, he did work so, for the yeah. he did work for the government, so. That's right. I, I have a knock Old habits up, die hard. So I would not put that past <laughs> <laughs> just, it, I mean, it, without. Like I went into autopilot mode and then all of a sudden there was a gun to his head and we were having that conversation. Yeah. I don't even know how I got there or it's how, like where that the old, gun came like, from. Yeah, it's like that old saying, without the government, who would publish the books? So I, you know. It's just, yeah, exactly. Anyway. Exactly. How would anything get done without <laughs> force and coercion and violence? So it wouldn't, dude. It would just it'd never happen. Yeah, so we'd reasons. all be in caves. We'd all be in caves, you know. And Facebook would be graffiti on the walls. And we'd so, all be we'd all be dying around each other. We'd have to step over corpses. Everybody would just yeah. be like falling over and dying. Rocks yeah, would like explode it, in our hands. Like like in <laughs> yeah, and and like in the, the tribes, you know, the the hunters would go out and hunt. Well, they sure as hell wouldn't share. So, you know, they would eat, everybody else would starve, you know, so, it, it, you know, so they had to have the chief and the witch doctor. Because they're evil capitalists, you know? Yes. <laughs> Only care about themselves. It's funny when people talk about that because it's like, well, you know, where does the profit come from that capitalists make? And it's like that's completely left out of the equation. Well, it's from people, you know, voluntarily valuing what I'm offering them more than they value their money. And unless yeah, it's a state backed monopoly, yeah. You know, yeah the, the, like well, a capitalist like, makes no with, money if yes. nobody wants what he's selling. Yes, I'm I'm not talking about what we have today, no, but in true capitalism, you know, state state monopolized capitalists that and cronies, that's a completely different story. But you know, it gets I, conflated I don't, so much it drives me absolutely but, nuts. Man. But that, but that greedy you know, capitalist has so much, he should just be willing to give it away to people who can't afford it. I mean, come on. Charging well, okay, anything, look, guys, charging, you, anything you is, I mean, charging anything trust is charging anything is oppression. Me. Trust yes. me, as a writer, I do. <laughs> as look, a writer, that's about all I do is give my stuff away. So, well, yeah, but you're still stealing this. But you're still stealing the surplus labor, the surplus value from workers <laughs> people involved in publishing your book. <laughs> and then, and then the IP laws, right? Like we're all anarchists here. I don't think anyone advocates for IP laws. So, like. If Only someone grabbed Rand's book and changed one else. letter in it and re republished it as the same book, rolling the bones, you know, re whatever. Different well, with, bones. A, with a Z I, instead you know, of an S at the end, right? Rolling yeah. the bones. That's I actually, uh, the way the market go, fixes go ahead, that is, is people that are big fans of that book, if they, if they were big fans, they as soon as they heard, hey, this guy just changed one letter, they would be like, oh my God, that guy's a farce. And they would go buy the other book. Or they'd obtain the other book, the real book. And well, shame the other guy. I would shame, shame the, the other shit guy. out of that guy. Yeah, exactly. Guy. Well, everybody's like, oh. I would like to think people would. Not everybody. Merciless. Not everyone. I, well, but, I other people would know, be going, oh, it's, he changed it and he's selling it for a buck less? Okay, I'll buy that one because it's the same book. <laughs> well, yeah, but then you see all the reviews from, you know, that I put out there because I'll put out like a dozen reviews saying about how this guy's a fraud and he's a utter garbage and how his mother never loved him and how uh, uh, not even not even pets like him would would and some people buy what, what would sure pestilence. yeah but should everyone but what be would you say about the other guy to prevent it no <laughs> <laughs> andre's gonna have like multiple accounts in the in capazon review you section. sock puppet <laughs> it, it, you know you're good when you you uh your your socks argue with each other that's, that's right that's right that's that's the level of trolling I I aspire to be. A schizophrenic. That's writing. excellent. That's that's, that's a good you thing to You to, really to. don't want to go down that road. <laughs> you find out yeah, how stupid um, other people really, 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 really are. <laughs> I don't yeah, have to know, go down I, that road to know how pe stupid people are. <laughs> yes, well, Rand, have, you were I, saying. I have well, I have differing views about IP, and I don't want to get into that right now. Um, I think there's a difference. I'll just state really quickly. I think there's a difference between uh, copyright or uh, patents and copyright, and I think there's a difference between copyright infringement and plagiarism. But in the digital world, it's like I have to put my book out digitally. It's you know it's just the way it is now, and it's going to get pirated. And there's really there's nothing you can do about it. So you know you no. just have to, you know it's like it would be like leaving your wallet in the mall and then expecting nobody to take the money out of it it's just it's yeah. not going to have you can't you can't protect it you can't stop it so you know i on the other hand what what percentage of the market is actually getting pirated but you know i i would probably have a problem with somebody 
you know, just making copies of my book and then selling it and keeping all the money. I, I don't think that's right. But again, you guys brought up a good point that, you know, as soon as the market found out about that, they would be, you yeah, know, all hell would, would break be, loose. They would yeah. be done. A lot of, their yeah, business yeah. would be done. A lot of people. Well, that's, um, that's the whole goal. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I just saw that happen with Stephen King on Amazon. I don't know if you guys saw, happen to notice some guy was putting out these Kindle short stories under the name of Stephen King. And he wasn't claiming to be the Stephen King. He was just putting them out under the Steve, name Stephen King. of Stephen King. And it was stories that Stephen, that the Stephen King didn't write, but he didn't claim they were. And they, the, 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 the comment sections were just horrendous. People just giving him all kinds of hell for what he was trying to do. So, yeah, I mean, that's, well, yeah, but that, that's, that works now. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody's, even if that's your real name, you got to change it. Days. <laughs> Well, no, you just, right, yeah, right. you can adjust what, or something, but you have to, uh, well, there are authors that put it out under the same name. They're just, I guess they get known for different genres and stuff, but you have to have the, you have to have the following in order for that to work first. And that's what, you know, you, what you were talking about before, like, you know, you have to put this out there right now because you're, you're trying to, you're trying to do this. And like, you know, if you, if your following gets big enough, then you can depend on that, hopefully depend on people uh, defending you in case that happens. You know, right, unfortunately, right, when you're first right. starting out, you, like you said, you have to take that risk and it's pretty much all risk <laughs> and, and praying yeah. for the reward <laughs> kind of thing. Cause you got, you know, you, you got to take that chance, right? There's, there's, there's really no other way around it. If you want to self publish, right. At least at this particular juncture. That's so I'm open to questions about the book. If anybody, if we want to get back to my book or not. Yes, or, and actually, uh, I was I was about to I was about to kind of turn the conversation back. Reading through the book, one of my favorites, my absolute favorite, which it's funny enough, it's not even one of the bigger ones or one of like the the better well known ones. The story is called "Request Denied," and I it just blew me. I mean, it literally blew you know, me away. I thought I, I thought you it. were gonna I thought you were gonna say that because I am getting that a lot. And it's interesting because I thought everybody would hate that story, and hmm. it's coming back as being one of the one of the best ones, probably right behind Forever and a Day. So uh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, no, no, no. I just wanted to know um, where that story came from. Like, what it, was that just something? It's just a thought that entered your head, and like, oh, this might seem like a cool idea, or you know, had it been something you'd written uh, a while back and rediscovered, or no, that's that's a newer story. Um, yeah, actually, that is really strange because it developed on its own. Um, I believe it just if metastasized I remember, like the text metastasized into sentences, or uh, it, it happens in <laughs> yeah, it happens in different ways. Um, you know, sometimes uh, the, the meat of the story will come to me, and most of the time it's just an opening scene uh, that just starts it plaguing my mind, and it won't go away till I sit down and write it. And uh, so I'll hammer out the opening scene, and then often it, it takes off on its own. And uh, that one, if I remember correctly, I'm having a hard time with that specific story, remembering exactly where it came from, but I believe that... The, the idea of being home alone at, you know, at night when it's dark and you hear somebody in your house, uh, I think was the, where the original idea was. And that's all I had. And that's usually all I do have. Um, and I don't know where the Dennis Green character came from. He developed. Uh, and, you know, OK, so why is this guy in the house? And and and. Uh, the confrontation. So we get to the confrontation. Now, I don't. I don't want to spoil it for anybody that hasn't read it, obviously. But um, uh, that one kind of just took off on its own, and and I developed the two characters. Once I had, I saw where it was going and what I needed to do. Then, I, then I went back and, and further developed the two characters, um, and and mirrored them off of each other. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say to, that to the have, way that the way that they they act is foils to each other or like alternate yeah. versions of each other I thought was a really really good touch yeah I I really I really expected in today's world I expected to have people hate that story because there's a racial element to it and not racism but you know I can't give away the ending but um, I, I really thought with everybody's knee-jerk reaction as soon as you start mentioning 
any kind of racial oh. element, then, then everybody, you know, is going to have a problem with it. But I haven't gotten that. Everybody has really, really liked the story. And uh, so, yeah, you've, you've got this. I don't think I'll give anything away here when I just say you've got this confrontation between a, a wealthy, successful businessman and a practically homeless thief and and the dialogue that goes on between them and that's and that's where the story really came out and 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 once i saw what i wanted to do with the story i went back and developed the characters a little further and and was really really happy with how the story came out and so evidently so is everybody else um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, like I said, it was, it was, it was by far like one of my favorite stories in the book. I, I think it's forever and a day, the crossing, uh, hell or high water and then request denied. Yeah. He hell four. or high water was, was one of my favorites to write along with the one that nobody mentions is, um, a bearable darkness of being. Um, that was one of my favorite ones for writing. Cause it's got that really weird element that kind of, otherly element to it yeah and and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because it's a it's not one that immediately comes to mind because it wasn't one that gripped me immediately but i didn't enjoy it any less if that makes sense because i really love the way that it was it was written in the way that it, it like the visual component of it that was written into the story and i thought it, it worked great i loved it <laughs> well thank you yeah it was you know there's there's different ways for me to enjoy the stories that i write and like uh a bearable darkness of being and hell or high water were both very enjoyable to write. They were just fun to write. Sort of like, sort of like cats was fun to write. Um, you <laughs> know, hell, hell or high water, which is sort of emerging to be the overall favorite of everybody. Um, that was, that's by far the hardest piece I've ever written. It took me six months to a year to write that piece uh, with lots and lots of research. And I'm really glad that you bring up that you liked that story because having the military experience that you have, I mean, I had to research all that. You know, there's a big portion of it for the, for those of you who haven't read it. Um, there's a big portion of it that takes place in uh, occupied France, World War Wait, II. Hell or high water or forever and a day? Forever and a day. Um, okay. When, when, when the, the protagonist is a, a young man and he's, you know, in, a young soldier in occupied France, you know, what do I know about that? So, <laughs> you know, I had to do tons of research, a lot of online research. And I read two different books about, um, D-Day and about occupied France and the, without giving anything away, the, the girl that emerges in that scene, Andre, that I discovered about that happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the French girls that, that were hooking up with, with the German soldiers. I discovered that in my research about occupied France, and it became a major P. I said, there, there's my answer right there. That was a major yeah. turning point in the story because I, I didn't know how I was going to get him. And that was 50 years ago from when the story takes place to the present day of the old man now that's lost everything, and he's thinking back through all this. How do we get him? You know, there, there's got to be a motivational factor, you know, when you look at the, the final scene, the final scene at the end, there's got to be a motivational factor yeah, as to why, 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 he, why he does what he does at the end. And that just opened it right up. As soon as I discovered, learned about that situation with the French girls in occupied France, it, 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 it gave me that element that I needed that I could then bring forward 50 years and, and give him that second chance. So, uh, again, it's, it's hard to, hard to discuss it without giving anything away, you know, but uh, yeah, especially, yeah. especially given but, just how, how much, how much detail there is in that story and how in depth it is and how gripping it is and how much it pulls you um, in. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, to let these guys know re just real quick, the, the story starts out with, with the protagonist, Red Kelly, is his name and he's shit i can't even remember how old he is what is he uh uh 70 something T yeah turning, 70 something turning 70 79 get ready to turn 80 yeah, i think that's is right. where that's it ended right. up being and and he's 
alone and he's lost everything and he's in this trashy apartment and he's it, they're they're threatening him with putting him his son's threatening to put him in a in a nursing home he's lost his wife he's lost his you know everything over the course of the year over the course of his life so then um we we do a series of flashbacks so he goes back remembering these different really important times in his life and and what happened and so we're going back and forth you know here's what happened with his wife here's what happened when he was in the you know over in occupied france all these horrible things that happened to him over the course of 50 years and now he's you know at the end of his life and he's lost everything so it was a lot of writing uh ended up being something over 100 pages of the book but specifically taking him back into that major scene in occupied france and this gets back to you being in the military andre was i didn't know if anybody'd buy it you know i did as much research as i could on D-Day and Occupy and the liberation of the French towns. I went through maps. I, I, I took measurements between the different cities and the order they were liberated by the, by the Allied troops. I had to do all of that, you know, and, and, and Patton was over there. And I didn't know if anybody who actually had military experience and knowledge would say, this is bullshit. <laughs> well, you know, I can, I I can tell, I I can tell you well right now, based on, based on what I read, and I don't know if I even mentioned this to you because I don't know if it came up in conversation beyond just a, like it being passing. But um, that research paid off. I, it really did read like it was true to life. Oh. Like you, it, yeah, or at least it I, felt the, or the way it felt to me was you were using somebody else's story like something oh, that you heard right. somebody tell you who was there, who saw that, to base your character, to base Red's experience off of. That's the way it read, or at least that's good, the way it read good. to me. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear so, that from somebody with your experience. You know, because anybody, I don't, I Joe don't Blow have could. Any experience, you know, Joe, Joe Blow could, <laughs> could read that and, and buy it, but anybody who, who, who knows anything about history or military might not buy it. It, it reminds me of Stephen King. Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, a great story oh, and a great man, that's movie. One of my favorites. You know, when he when he wrote that and then he got interviewed later, you know, people were asking him, you know, he went he went to prisons and and interviewed people and you know to, to find out how all the inner workings of the prison and how everything works and he said, "No, I made it all up." So, you know, it's that's that kind of a thing. You have you have the ability, I guess if you can make it believable, you can you can make it up and but i i really in in all of my work i do research of the time and region that the story takes place in order to drop just enough accurate detail in to make it believable uh you know i don't don't just make stuff up and throw it out there it it really needs to to be plausible i think for the for the time and and the region that it takes place for instance, Andre, in The Crossing, we have, towards the end, we have the flashback back to 1935. You know, The hmm. Crossing takes place, it's 12-year-old, two 12-year-old boys. It's very much reminiscent of some of the characters in The Body or Stand By Me by Stephen King. But you got these two, two main characters, 12-year-old boys. It takes place in 1975 when I was 12 years old. So I was able to do that just out of my own experience. But then we have this flashback towards the end, back to 1935. Well, <laughs> you know, how are you going to write about what was going on in 1935? So I have to start research. What kind of cars do they have? You know, what kind of clothes did they wear? You know, and 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 drop it. I had to look up, for instance, did they have Coke, Coca Cola, in 1935? Because the guy's packing two cokes in in a picnic basket take his daughter fishing I'm thinking well did they have coke in 1935 you know you have to start thinking about that kind of thing and to answer the question they did have coke i don't know if it still had cocaine in it by then but probably not but um so you know no, but it was but it was in green glass bottles it was <laughs> <laughs> so you know and then the truck he's driving i had to i had to find out what was a popular truck in 1935 so i like to i do you, you can take license with with a lot of the generalities, but you really, I, I feel like I need to drop in as much accuracy in, in culture and, and region and time for the setting to make it plausible. So I, I do put that work into it just to make it that much more believable 
rather than just making up a bunch of crap. You know, it's not science fiction. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I actually get a little bit lucky with that because I have a serial that I write that is that's science fantasy ish. So I can kind of just like, mm. yeah. But actually, I'm glad well, you brought up the crossing in a, in and that scene in particular because that's one of my favorite things about this book is every single story in this book, with I think one exception. I think uh, uh, A Bearable Darkness of Being is the only one that I don't recall actually linking to any of the other ones. I don't think. Um, actually, it does, but it's very sub very uh, subdued. We can get to that later if you want to continue. Yeah. But uh, no, I just wanted to say, um, and this is for everybody who hasn't read the book, uh, Jeremy and Dave, I think you'll actually find this really interesting. Every single one of these stories mm -hmm. features characters from the other stories. Oh, that's cool. It's, yeah. Like it's that. it's incredible and it's it's so well done and it's not, you know, it's not in your face. It's not, you know, he didn't push it to make it, you know, make you notice, but it's, you know, it's little things like uh, the in the crossing when they have that flashback to 1935, I'm reading and I just see him mention red and I'm like, I know who that is. That is so cool. Yeah, we take the old man and he he turns into a what a 10-year-old boy. Yeah. Back in 1935, yeah. that just happens to appear in town for a short period, and it's that character. It's that character. You know, you'd have to catch it. Oh, that's red. I know from, who that red is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So just enough that you'd have to really be paying attention to to catch it. Well, now that you was gave that, it away. Now everybody knows. <laughs> well, that I'll try to keep it keep it a little more subliminal. But that was I, I wanted to do that, and that was after the fact. Now. So basically, I wrote this book twice. Um, <laughs> after I put the 12 stories together, I put a big dry erase board on the wall, and I put the the year that the stories are taking place, the region that it's taking place in, the characters. I had to write it all on a dry erase board and then start dry, drawing lines of how I could interlink the stories together and and not break the timelines and not you know obviously somebody that's in one state isn't going to just appear in another state so it had to be sort of regional it had to be the same eras that the stories took place in and that so i had to rewrite the entire you know every one of the stories i had to rewrite every one of them and go through and rewrite the whole book and when i when i did that i decided i wasn't going to advertise that I'm going to let the reader discover that, that they're, that they're all interwoven. But everybody on Amazon's talking about it now anyway, so the cat's out of the bag. So, yeah, I probably spent... <laughs> I love when books do geez, stuff like that. It was, probably, it, was, stuff like that. it was probably several weeks that I spent linking all these stories together and writing all over this dry erase board to be able to link them together plausibly. And to answer your question, Andre, the... Um, a bearable darkness of being is actually linked to uh, request denied, and it's linked to chambers. Because remember when he's walking you're home right. in the dark. You're right. In the dark. You're, you're 100 percent correct. That's well, right. I would hope he would be, considering he wrote it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I know yeah, that. Yeah, Shut yeah, up, yeah, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he 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 sees the guy at the bus stop when he's on his way to work that ends yeah. up being the guy from request denied. And he sees when he's walking home at, at night that one time, and he sees the guy from the tanning salon. Yeah, yeah. Now I remember. Out. Oh my and, god, that's and, fantastic. And he comes out and and he's he's drunk and he stumbles to his car and he watches him, you know, meander his car off onto the highway. <laughs> right. So, oh my god. Yeah, that yeah, is, yeah, that is yeah, awesome. Well, I love it. It, it got kind of some of those were kind of easy because four of those stories take place in Las Vegas, so I was able to connect those four pretty easily uh the calling was in las vegas it's connected to request a night also and chambers was in las vegas and uh bearable darkness of being takes place in, in vegas. Uh, las vegas so, so that's kind of like a um, an esoteric uh you know a little easter egg in the in the book there yeah yeah i mean because readers i i like that when i read mm -hmm. uh when the stories are kind of interlinked like that or even when they do a movie that's a collection of short films that are linked together. It's always fun. It just adds another element. And so I wanted to add that and just let my readers discover that and enjoy it. And they did discover it. And of course, everybody's talking about it now on Amazon. So 
and they and they they're appreciating it, which is the whole point is to to give the give the readers one more one more thing to enjoy <laughs> while they're reading the reading the book. No, we we are, um, or at least I know I am, and I everybody I've talked to who has read it has felt the same way. I mean, I, I've. I have yet to hear anything really particularly negative about the writing or in particular the features you put into the book, such as characters appearing between different stories. So yeah, I and, think you hit it out of the park. An, another thing that sort of manifests because I'm a graphic designer and have been for 25 years and, and, and I've been writing since I was a kid and I enjoy aesthetically pleasing text in a book that I, I like a, a book that's well designed. I end up, Part of my technique is I use, and I'll let I'll let Andre elaborate a little bit on this because he's mentioned it before. I use I will use unconventional uh, formatting of my text uh, as a visual, almost a visual cue to help get a point across, uh, which is which is um, maybe a little a little unusual. Uh, and, and you know I threw the rule the, I threw the rules out and said I'm going to do this the way I want to do it, and so. I use very unconventional techniques in some of the stories in the way that I present the text to to make even a bigger mm -hmm. impact on the reader. Uh, would, yeah, would you say I, that's I, accurate, Andre? Yeah, and actually, I, I wanted to mention because a sweet ride. I really noticed that uh, the way that you you organize the text and the way that you had the sentences and how you opened and closed uh, that paragraphs. Is a, like it added a visual element to what I was reading. So exactly, like it, it, exactly it reinforced what what I was picturing in my mind. Probably the, the, the biggest example of that, the most intense example of that would be the traveler. Yes. The, the way I, I did something I've never seen done in any book before. And, you know, that's the, that's the story that when I wrote it back in 2009, uh, it won an international fiction competition, was published in like five countries and six or six countries and five languages or something like that. But and and somebody did mention I do have that now out on a, as a Kindle single. Uh, a reviewer on Amazon did mention that they liked not only the story itself, but they liked how it was written. So it was noticed that the technique I used uh, there's sort of two two uh, two overlapping techniques, and one is you know I'm I'm famous for my flashback scenes for one thing so it's got all these flashbacks in it but the way i blended the flashbacks with the present scenes i've never seen that done before have you andre uh, i mean you know, i'm, it, I'm, it I'm would, clearly was, not as well read as as everybody else here <laughs> in the room but as far as what i've read and what i've tried to get my hands on to read um that's the first time i've seen it done that way and it yeah, it, and, it, it really felt like I wish I had a, a, a cinematic example because I'm really good with movies. That's usually what I do, but I can't. One's not coming to mind right now. I'm drawing a blank. I mean, but he's, he's really it, good with pornos. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, but it's all free. I don't pay for any of it. <laughs> no, but uh, um, it's it's seamless. Is th That's the best way I can describe it. It's seamless. Like It, it jumps yeah. back and forth from scenes in the past, in the protagonist's past, to the present, what's happening. And it's seamless. Like it literally leaves off on the word, right? Into right. The right. Next it, scene. It's it, incredible. It, it 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 breaks. It. I don't think I'll be giving any surprises away here. It breaks mid sentence, and then it starts the next scene with the same exact sentence, only it's yeah. in a different context. Exactly. So you're reading the final sentence of the of the present scene ends abruptly. And you read the same exact sentence as the opening of the flashback scene, except it's in a different context. So it really just, you know, w without hmm. even a, a, a hesitation, it takes you right into, you know, back and forth between the scenes. And and the editor of the magazine that it was published in, uh, it's it's now defunct. It went out out of business because of the internet. But it was a a subscription magazine, literary magazine, and the editor wrote an editorial about that story the traveler um when when it when it won the competition and was published and she likened it to a movie as well andre she said it's it's almost like a screenplay or a movie i i take you back and forth between these scenes and then not only that but i tie the beginning of the story to the end of the story and yes. you have you have the exact same paragraph 
you know, some of the exact same paragraphs and descriptions in the beginning of the story that you have in the end of the story, only in a different context. So it comes full circle as well. So it, it, it was a lot of work to do that, but it paid off. And again, you, I think you mentioned a sweet ride, Andre. Um, I, I, I did some of that in a sweet ride also. And a sweet ride is the, the first story I ever wrote back in, I don't know, 1999 or 2000, right in there. And it, it, it does have some of that technique in it. So I kind of expanded on it with the traveler, uh, really went heavy on some of that technique. But uh, one of my friends, one of my, a business associate that, that has read the book, uh, had a problem with a sweet ride. And I, I don't want to mention what it's about because it'll it'll ruin it for anybody that reads it. So I'll leave that as a mystery. But <laughs> the the sub the subject matter of that story, ultimately the subject matter she had a personal problem with. And I got to thinking about it and I thought, well, that's not really what a sweet ride is about. A sweet ride is about language. It's about uh, words. It's about double meanings and plays on words. It, it really the story yeah. itself is is technically about language. I just used the story to demonstrate what can be done with language. So I also, if I say so myself, think that was kind of a, a unique approach to writing a story. Any any other others that you wanted to discuss, Andre? Or do we well, do we need to be <laughs> do we have time? I mean, I think we're we're starting to get to the end of it. I will say this though. I mean, I did not find a single story in the book that I did not enjoy reading. That was not oh. a pleasure to read. Now, some of them were <laughs> a lot more it's gripping awesome. and intense. Some of them were much more difficult to read, just because of yeah. the subject matter. Subject matter, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, like it for does, example, rough, it, roughing it was was hard. <laughs> were you reading it, it like was, you were bracing for a car crash? Is that is yeah? That what, that's uh, that's ex yeah. That's exactly I, what it was. It I was, do that too. It was rough. It, well, it was ex exactly the way yeah, it was. I, I'm, was yeah, titled. I'm glad you. I, I'm glad you bring that up because that's why I had to change the title of the book over the years because when I was younger I was writing predominantly horror I wrote roughing it I wrote a sweet ride um, there's another story that never saw the light of day that was called VI virus intellectus but anyway um, it was horror and so when I initially thought about putting a collection together I was going to call it chambers and the idea was either I hadn't decided yet but it's either like being in a dungeon and there's all these chambers and each chamber you would there would be like an introduction and you open the door and, it's, and each chamber is its own story or like a haunted house kind of thing where each room is a chamber and it's his own story so i was going to call it chambers and except over the years my writing evolved and i wasn't really doing horror anymore i was doing you know the whole gamut i do drama and coming of age and a lot of psychological stuff and i and ghost stories and i i wouldn't call rolling the bones a collection of horror stories uh, yeah, it it's, has it's not. It's probably really not. three probably three horror stories in it chamber and and chambers and that's the other thing i was going to say is i had a different story the one that ultimately is called chambers in the book was originally called let there be light and course that's to date the most horrific story i've ever written i think it surpassed roughing it uh, yeah it was pretty bad it was, it was bad in terms of just like <laughs> like pure impact it was yeah it was harsh. yeah um uh, and so so being <laughs> able to change that to chambers and being able to alter the story to fit the title chambers and i was able to keep that chambers idea it's just w one of the longer stories in in the book now and that story, believe it or not, I kind of conjured it. I was laying in bed one night and I got to thinking about what would be the worst possible way that you could die? What would be just a horrific way to die? And that's how I came up with that Surrounded idea. By commies. And, oh. and, and of course, then I had to, when, once, once we placed him in that situation he was in in the beginning, well, then I had to develop all the backstory of, of, of how does he get there. And uh, so the ultimate end that you're aware of, Andre, was actually a surprise to me that where, where he ultimately went with that ended up being totally unexpected, but it kind of helped explain all the whole entire story. So it kind of came together on its own just from thinking about 
what would be a, a, a horrific way to die. And then like cats was the same way. Yeah. I thought <laughs> I was laying is. in bed one night and I thought, <laughs> I wonder if I could write a story. You know, I'm a cat lover and it, it's ridiculous to think about, you know, cats being, but what about in mass? What if, you know, you had li- literally hundreds of cats and I, I literally thought the whole story oh. through laying in bed that night and I got up the next morning and wrote it in one day, the original uh, version of it in one day. And I've, I've since gone back and cleaned it up. But so that, that was just, again, I conjured that story of saying, is it, would it be possible for cats to go bad and, and to be a, a menace? But a lot of the other ones, the traveler came to me with the opening scene. Uh, Forever and a day came to me with the opening scene. I, I, I have this old man sitting on his bed looking at his feet and a cockroach crawls across the floor and he's watching the cockroach. That's all I had with that story. And it just <laughs> developed from there. Uh, I mean, that's, that's how, that's how all of my stories to date have hit me. So uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. They, and they won't leave you alone. You get this no. scene and it, and with the traveler, the scene was just the guy, you guys are familiar being in the South and on the East coast. You're familiar with storm mm-hmm. doors. We don't have yep. much of those yep. here yeah. in Vegas. Yep. But you've probably all been in a situation where you went to go out the front of your house and there was a storm brewing. And right when you open that glass storm door, a gust of wind hits it and it slams it back in your face, right? Yeah. Yep. And yep. so that was the scene I had, this guy leaving his house and the, the, the storm is brewing and it blows the storm door back in his face when he's trying to go out the front door. That's all I had. So I sit down and it bug, bugged me and bugged me and bugged me and I sit down and hammered it out and it went all the way up to the girl. Andre. And then it ended. I didn't know where to go from there. And it, and it was that way for two years. I was actually at work two years later one day and the whole rest of the story came to me and I realized who, who the traveler was. I realized why it was all happening and I went through and, and uh, finished the story. So, but yeah, those, those damn scenes come to you and you can't get them out of your head. You have no choice <laughs> to sit down and yeah. hammer it out. And then, you know, it, uh, it, one of the things I really liked about Hell or High Water was the scene I had was the guy on the on the motorcycle out in the west traveling in the heat, you know, where you can see forever, and he decides to stop at some small town and go into this diner. That's all I had. And remember Isa, yep. the, the, yep. the waitress in the diner? She shows up out of nowhere and just takes over the story, and it was really, really fun. So she ends up being really the main character of the story totally unexpectedly and i and i ended up having to revolve the whole story more around her than than the guy and and um, that's another another technique i use that i think is unique is i I look at a story and i say you know is this really critical the story there's several stories in the book where the character's name is never mentioned and i do that on purpose you know and i say you know it doesn't matter the, the name is immaterial. So we never mention the guy's name, the biker in right. that story. We never mention the guy's name, the writer in A Sweet Ride, you know, things like that. So, and w- one of one of my readers noticed that and actually mentioned that in on Amazon and said, uh, you don't need to know their name because they are us and we know who we are because it's just... It's it's the guy down the street. It could be you. It could be somebody you know. They're just normal, everyday people. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. You don't have to come up with some fancy name that, that just sounds corny. You know, Slade Rock or something like that. You know, just... So, you know. <laughs> Big McLarge Huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Like Hugh G. Rection. Yeah, exactly. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, oh, so there's all of these, what I, you know, I have a little bit of a trouble talking about it, you know, patting myself on the back, I feel like, but there's a lot of really unique techniques that I use in my writing that's in this book that I think readers would enjoy. And, you know, so I, I just, I hope that eventually well, uh, it catches on out there. Yeah. Uh, I've sold, I've, I've given away probably more than I've sold. Uh, it's been out. It'll be. It went out in June of last year. I think. I think on online, I've gotten maybe a couple of dozen orders, uh, and I've given away a couple of dozen. I think, but 
friends and, and business associates and stuff. So, Well, as uh, June approaches I, this year, I know I am going to try and push it as hard as I can. I mean, granted, I have like about this much reach, but I'm going to push it as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. I, th- I think we all I have think, our own little corner, Andre. Hopefully, hopefully. I, I think. I think when we do your book, Andre, it'll you know, and cross promote, it'll help both of us. So I certainly hope so. Well, and, I certainly and, hope so. And hopefully, we'll, we'll we'll get you a little bump from here. Uh, you know. Yeah, I, I and heard- you know, it's it, it's getting a lot of five star reviews on Amazon and on Goodreads, and I have a lot of personal people ranting and raving to me about it. So I, I think there's enough confidence with the readership out there that you can take a chance. Uh, it's not garbage. But it's yet to <laughs> be right. seen. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I I I I I, I had the Kindle version of it a while ago. I just it's on my pile of you know physical and digital. Right. Well, move it up the I, list. I'm, I think I'm going to now after after you talking it up so much, Andre. And then I'm going to hold. I'm not going to hold Rand. I'm going to hold Andre personally responsible if I don't like it. Well, uh, so that's to, okay. you know, to to be fair, I do have, uh, you know, I have clients that I've given books to, and. You know, I've had people. It's it's not their bag. It's not everybody's bag. Um, if, well, no, I, if, if I like, I, you know, so I like horror. I like other type of uh, stuff. So yeah, um, you know, it, it's it's not. I, I the people who have a problem with it seem to be that they like to read really simple, surface, easy stories, and these stories are all pretty deep and they, they make you think about things and they deal with issues and, and they're all connected with each other. So yeah. it, it's not, it's not easy peasy reading. There's, you know, there's some depth to it. And I think people that are just looking to be entertained uh, don't really get it. Um, so, you know, I don't expect everybody to like it, but if you like, you know, something that has some, some depth and some dynamic to it and, and, gives you pause to think about things and some issues and things and, and, and the psychology behind the characters and you'll probably enjoy it. Yeah. Well, yeah. like I said, I, I, I encourage everybody to check it out. I'm, I'm definitely going to bump it up my list now and, and try I'll to get snag a copy and, and eventually get around to it. <laughs> so do you want to just uh, quickly plug, I mean, I'll put it in the show notes too, but do you want to just quickly plug where we can get all your, get, get everything? Your Who, me? Yeah, yeah, you ran. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Oh, yeah, plug everything. Okay, the book is called Rolling the Bones, 12 Tales of Life, Death, Loss, and Redemption. It's a 500-page trade paperback. It's available on Amazon in paperback and on Kindle, and it's available in paperback on barnesandnoble.com and walmart.com. Uh, I also have a blog, randeastwood.com, and, of course, on my profile page on Facebook, I have links to all of my Facebook pages and my blogs and everything. So I have Randy Eastwood blog, Facebook page. I have Randy Eastwood author, uh, Rolling the Bones Facebook page, and an upcoming podcast, which you can go ahead and like the Randy Eastwood podcast. The page is up. Um, I'm still in the, in the developmental process, um, securing equipment and stuff I need because I really, once I launch it, I want to do. Uh, a pretty in-depth program. I don't want it to just be, it's going to be a video podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be just a recording of a Skype conversation. So I have, I actually am producing a a, a small, a small set and I'm going to have multi-cam views and I've got the editing software and I'm really working on where I can actually put together and, and, and interlace it with a little bit of entertainment, some video clips and things. I kind of want to go more of a program than just you know, two guys talking on Skype. And I've got a couple of guests. I'll keep that secret, but I have a couple of guests lined up already. All right. uh, both both of which you both, you all are probably very f- familiar with. They're, they're pretty uh, active in the Liberty community. But anyway, so that's going to be my upcoming podcast, which I hope to kind of mirror my blog, which is Thoughts on Life, Liberty, and Happiness. I don't just write about liberty, but, you know, psychology and sociology and spirituality and and life, you know, yeah, anything that I have discovered in my, uh, well, long years of living, <laughs> uh, that I, that I think would be helpful to others and that, or things that have really impacted me. I, I write about, I've got a hundred and some odd articles about a lot of different subjects on my blog at randyswood.com. And so I want to kind of do a video version of that and bring people onto the program of the podcast that know a lot more than I do, which isn't, that's not hard to do. I don't, 
I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I'm no expert. That's for sure. So I want to bring guys on that are kind of relative. An exp- expert, yeah. Rand. <laughs> yeah, I want to bring people on that are more, you know, that have some expertise in some areas where I can give them the, the floor, and I would just present the information really in, in a program fashion. So. There you are. That's pretty much everything, but rolling the bones, Amazon.com. All right. Well, like I said, I'll put all the stuff in the show notes too. So Okay. Thanks for uh thanks for coming on, Rand. This was uh this was fun. Uh, I'm definitely gonna check out your book and I hope others do too. Yeah. Uh no. Andre, it was nice having you around again. And it's always a pleasure. It's always, yeah, a, pleasure. always. It a pleasure always being always on the pleasure. on the program with you, Rand. So I'm I'm glad we're oh, on yeah. the together. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on and uh sharing all you, you wanted to about your yeah. book, man. Yeah, well, yeah, I really appreciate that. I, I I really do. You don't you don't know how much I appreciate you letting me come on and plug my book, but also when we get done with Andre's book later this year, maybe we can do a follow up about his book, but uh, and that yeah. publishing process. So sure, sure. All right, it wouldn't be a lot of fun, but anyway, just the, just yeah, the publishing thanks. process, though, because the subject is going to be garbage compares to rolling <laughs> the bones. So. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. I'm I'm interested. I've read parts of it, and I'm I'm still wondering where it's going. So, well, fair enough. So I, well, I decided. Okay. Yeah, well, we I decided sh- to we wait till I get the we whole get thing. There. We shall yeah. see when we get there, and then we'll cross promote our books. Come you know summertime, and hopefully we can both bump ourselves up. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And, and thank you guys for having me on, too. Oh, you're quite welcome. Oh, it was, it was awesome. All right. Well, this has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast. All of our information can be found at theseedsofliberty.com. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Peace. Peace. All right, see you. Peace. Bye. Seeds of Liberty. Seeds of Liberty. Seeds of Liberty. Seeds of Liberty. Michael Dean from the Freedom Teens Radio Show. I've run websites since 1996 and have used over a dozen web hosts in that time. Agoristhosting.com is the only one that hasn't broken my heart. Agorist Hosting's uptime and service is stellar, and their DDoS mitigation is the best I've seen. That's important because if you tell the truth in this world, you'll ruffle feathers. No matter what the haters hit us with, Agorist Hosting keeps our websites online. If you have a mission-critical commercial presence or a world-changing activism site, go with Agoristhosting.com. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the Bipcot No Government License. The Bipcot No Gov License allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to bipcot.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org.